Hey everybody, it's Vanessa the Crafty Gemini and welcome to Whip Wednesday episode number 91. Today I'm going to be answering some of the pre-submitted questions on a couple of different things that tend to come up pretty often. And so I thank you all for joining me here, whether you're watching us on Facebook or on YouTube, make sure that you give this video a thumbs up. And let's just pop into the chat real quick to make sure that everybody who's tuning in live here can see me and hear me before we move on. So hey everybody, hi Zena. She says hello everybody from partly cloudy Florida. She's a neighbor, so yes, definitely partly cloudy today here in North Central Florida, where I'm coming to y'all from my home crafting studio right here. Hey, Mary Grace, tuning in from Colorado. Tracy says hello. Hey, Leona, we got Claudette in the house from Southern California. Annette from Louisville, Kentucky. Hey, Barb, tuning in from California. And Susan from Phoenix. Great, y'all can see me and hear me, so this is great. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I think I have about four questions to answer today that we printed out from the form. I just wanna always give y'all a heads up. If you have a question that you'd like to submit for me to consider answering in a future Whip Wednesday episode here, uh, make sure that you click open the video description box on YouTube or it's in the caption also here if you're catching us on Facebook and that will take you to a Google form where you can enter your name, you know, and the, and the question that you have for us because every week as we prepare for Whip Wednesday episodes, my team and I go through there and we kind of select uh, some of the questions that we're going to answer. So you can always be submitting questions and just adding to the very long list of question submissions there. Okay. All right. Now, first thing first, before we jump into uh, the questions, let me take a sip of water. We wanted to give y'all a heads up that if y'all have been tuning into the most recent Whip Wednesday episodes, you've probably caught on to the flash sales that we've been doing on one-off course, uh, one-off of my digital courses, like on a specific bag, we'll put it on sale just from Wednesday till the weekend. And so if you're catching us here on Whip Wednesdays, definitely watch us. If you can't catch us live, watch the replay because sometimes I'm doing little demos, um, offering different coupon codes and sales and things like that. And so this week's sale, we've actually put together a three-course three uh, bag making course bundle at a discounted price. So, and I'm gonna show you the three bags real quick. You can click the link and that'll take you to the page with all the details to show you exactly, you know, how many video lessons each project has, but we're featuring three tote bags that are, you know, in the bigger size range. And so the first one that's included in the bundle is uh, the Vega project bag. We did this one in, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, in one of the bag clubs that I did and it is, I designed it at least to work as a project bag. So you see I have some yarn in there and then there's two mesh zippered pockets on each side. So you can store notions, other little things that you wanna put there. And so that same mesh pocket that you see open here, there's another one on the opposite side that I have more yarn in. There's some really cool techniques that we use in the course here, teaching you how to make this. You can see the side panel that's pleated and then the whole thing is bound. And this one, I use the same fabric as the exterior to do the binding and it has cute little handles. Some students decided to add a snap here. You can do that or you can leave it open, which is what I prefer when I do use it as a project bag. So that is my Vega project bag. That's one of the projects and this bundle again is going to include three courses and you get $44 off the total. So normally we sell our digital courses at this time in recent years for $37 each of the digital courses and most of you know once you pay for one of my classes or my clubs it never expires so you don't have to keep paying it's not a subscription you pay one time and three years from now you can log in and watch the videos again. So this instead of $37 each would be a total of like $111 you're saving $44 so you can sign up for all three of these classes for 67 bucks and that price is valid only from today, Wednesday, until Sunday, I believe that's May 21st at midnight. So if you haven't checked out these bags, these are some of my more popular projects as well. And so that's why we bundled these three up. So that's the first one. The second one is the Everyday Tote Bag, which we did a flash sale on, um, not super recently, but kind of recently. It has a zippered panel. The exterior here has pockets all around. You have straps that get sewn in on the bottom. So you know that the straps are going to be super strong and hold up. And I know a lot of my students over the years have used this one as a diaper bag because you can put a ton of stuff all the way around in those pockets and then you open up the zipper and you have a huge compartment on the inside. So that's the everyday tote bag, another super popular one and really, really sturdy and a good size. That's kind of why I wanted to show y'all like this, like in reference to my head and my body so you can see the good size. And the finished measurements are on the, the product listing page also. The third bag course that's gonna be included in this bundle 
is my Tamiami tote bag. And this is a wild one that I put together <laughs> uh, using a basketball print so I can wear it to basketball games. It has um, faux leather on the bottom, but it has a lot of zippered compartments. So you have your main one here at the top, of course. Inside, there is another zippered pocket smaller one right there and you have the good big opening there and then underneath this little lime green trim that you see right here is actually that's a panel that's covering another zipper that's there for a front zippered pocket okay so a lot of zipper compartments and it's a big size bag i know when we did this one in the club a lot of my students were like oh for some reason i thought it was actually a little bit smaller but it's really big and it has a crossbody strap that's adjustable. So you can wear it crossbody or you can wear it over the shoulder. So it's up to you, you know, how long you want to have it. And so again, of course, these are all different types of techniques that I'll be teaching y'all in the classes and they're all step-by-step -step instruction. So if you can sew straight, if you can change the needle, you know, rewind a bobbin, basic troubleshooting of your sewing machine, you can totally tackle these projects. Here's another one. It's the one that you'll see in the um, marketing images for the class itself with a rainbow zipper, super cute. And again, underneath that little contrasting panel, you have a hidden zippered pocket, okay? So zipper in the front. And then of course, everything is lined. Wrong pocket there. <laughs> the hot pink there is the zippered pocket that I have on the inside, okay? So a lot of different compartments, good size tote bags. These would make great gifts for anybody. I know some of my students use these as like their everyday work bag. They put their lunch and their stuff or for a change of clothes if they're going to go to the gym after work. So, you know, when you have a bigger tote bag, you can get a lot of uses out of it. Margie says they hold so much. Yes. And Windless Original says that's a great deal. It is. So each one of those three classes is regular $37 per digital course. And so if you get these three in the bundle, they come out to just under $23 per course, which is really, really a great value, I think, especially since the videos don't expire. You don't have to rush to try and get it done by a certain date or anything like that. Okay. So the link is in the description box below for that bundle. And again, it's only going to be valid from today, Wednesday, whatever today is May 17th. Is that right? Until May 21st. Yes. Okay. So that's that. And so we'll see how this course bundle does. And then we'll maybe play around with doing different little themed bundles, you know, maybe putting together some of my wallets and some of my other courses that I have as well. Okay. Okay, let's see. All right, so let's get started with the questions. Jackie B says, I've got it and I've made all three. I love it. I love to hear it. Great. All right, so the first question is from Margie, and Margie asks, Hey, can you talk about wool pressing mats if you've had experience with them? Do you like or dislike them? All right, Margie, so I have pulled out the two wool pressing mats that I have. Let's go ahead and give them this over the shoulder shot. Um, I can't always show everything because the, the lens that I use here, y'all, is a little bit. Um, it's more zoomed in, you know, so I can't really get a, a far away shot, but these two are small enough. I think that I can show you. So these are the only two pressing mats that I have that are with the wool, the felted wool pressing mats. And I know in recent years, uh, maybe like in the last seven years, six, seven years or something, I've kind of seen a push towards this, especially among quilters. And I had bought some for that purpose to try them out and see what's what. And I have, maybe if you've been in my clubs or my courses, you kind of see me use some here or there. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the specs of it, what exactly it is in case some of you were wondering, and then I'll share my experience and what I think. Okay. So the wool mats, they're usually about half of an inch thick. And I think the smaller one, they're both the same. They're about half of an inch thick and it's felted wool fibers. Okay. So if you know anything about wool and undyed wool, you may know that it has a woolly smell. We actually have sheep and we shear the sheep. We use the wool, at least I do, to spin it into yarn. And I've made knitted projects, crocheted stuff. And you know, when you wet wool, which is an animal fiber, sometimes you get that little, you know, barn smell like a sheep. So when I first used steam on these guys, it smelled like woolly sheep to me, which I know if you're not into fiber and knitting and into that kind of stuff, you may not be into that smell. So if it catches you off guard, know that that's what's going on is because it's natural wool. And you can even see on some of this, like some of these, I even still can see like some organic matter, like little chunks of hay, like this one here looks like a little grass seed or something, you know, that gets caught in the wool fibers, which is what we have also because we shear our sheep. So you're always going to have vegetable matter in there. Okay and they call it VM. So 
Um, that's, that's something to keep in mind. I have talked to my friends that also use some wool mats and some of them have said that they've never had that issue. I don't know if it's maybe the manufacturer or where they got their wool mats from. Um, and maybe there's some other type of stuff in there, or maybe they process the wool, you know, somehow. But this to me is just like rustic felted wool and it smells like sheep. Okay. Which I don't have a problem with. I'm just saying heads up in case you do. This one here measures, I think it's 12 inches by 18. And it's actually the one that I use the most when it comes to using these 12 by 18. Yes. So the main reason I grab it is twofold. One, because when I'm filming video lessons and courses and tutorials and stuff, I can easily grab it. It's pretty lightweight and I can just place it here. The gray is pretty neutral. And so depending on the color of fabrics that I'm working on, you know, everything else on this gray background stands out pretty good. So for my business purposes of video instruction, I like that it's a neutral surface. You know, there's nothing messing with the stuff in the background. That's one. And then two is the weight of it because look, you can even roll it up, tuck it away somewhere. You know, it's pretty lightweight, pliable. And so it makes it easy to tote around. Okay. I know that they sell them even smaller than this. So if you're going to a class or a retreat, that would be something fun, you know, to take with you. That's not super big or super heavy. Okay. This other one here, I don't use quite as often because it is bigger. Um, and so because it's bigger, it's heavier. This one measures 24 by 14, I believe. Yeah. 24 by 14. So they come in different sizes. You know, if you have a small workspace or you need it for travel, just maybe if you're into getting one, just look for one that's going to accommodate, you know, the size projects that you're going to be working on. A lot of quilters love this. Okay. And I'll tell you a couple of reasons why one, because it's a wool fiber and it's felted. Okay. It's basically so dense and, and felted up that when you iron something on here, you're basically ironing both sides. Okay. So if you're ironing and pressing patchwork, you don't have to really flip it over and do the other side because as it gets sandwiched between the iron and the wool, it, you're doing the job. Okay. So for those of us that also like to use a tailor's clapper, say with the wool mat, I find that that combo, a hot iron, the wool mat, and my tailor's clapper really, really gives me some crispy flat, flat seams. So I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of quilters in more recent years started going to the wool mat because it just gives you the flattest, crispest seams. And, and I do agree with that pro of it. I do get really flat seams when I use this with the clapper, both. The other thing is that it's reversible. So it's a, just a chunk of felted wool. So you can use this side, you can flip it over, use this side. This one got a little dirty at the last retreat. I took it over there and one of the irons spit stuff on it, but I mean, it's still totally usable. Okay. And then let me see what else I had written on here. Just a couple of things to, um, trigger my memory. Oh, the other thing is that I often use it. Like I mentioned earlier for filming my videos and courses and stuff. And so I will just put it right on here. And obviously this is a cutting mat. You got to be careful depending on what you have underneath. You can wreck the table, the surface, the cutting mat and all that, because if you're pumping steam through here and heating it up, it's still going to go through the fibers and you can wreck your table surface underneath. Ask me how I know when I really, really use like my Laura star iron and I use a ton of steam on the wool mat right here. I find that this will bubble up on me. And then I have to remember like, Oh yeah, maybe not so much steam and it kind of bubbles up, but then it smooths out, you know, cause I just add some extra weight to it overnight, put some books on the mat and just let it kind of cool down and come back to the, to shape. And I haven't really had an issue. And I've done that before too on, on my green Ulfa mats as well, but just keep that in mind. Cause some of you, I know, sew and prep your stuff on like a dining room table. You don't want to do this over a wooden table cause you can wreck it. Okay. And then, yeah. And then that's the other thing that it was lightweight and it rolls up. Now a couple of cons one, the smell that I mentioned earlier. And again, not all of them apparently have that sheepy smell. Mine did both of them. <laughs> I was fine with it. Not everybody is Two is that they're pretty pricey. I can't remember. I mean, I bought this years ago, so I'm not sure exactly what the price was, but I remember thinking $70 for a chunk of felted wool or something like, like it was up there. Okay. Like 50, 60, $70 or something like that. I paid. Uh, so it is pricey. Um, you will need something underneath it. And then, oh, this is the main thing. Cause we were talking about this at my last mini bag making retreat. My friend, Laura has one of these and she was wondering why her iron got dirty underneath. And so if you use really hot irons, like we do, we have these T fall irons that get really hot. You got to be super careful because 
it can actually melt this, like it can scorch onto the bottom of your iron and dirty it up. So she was getting like a brown film and it's because the iron was so, so hot and she wasn't using anything else. She didn't have starch. She wasn't fusing an adhesive or anything. And so we basically realized like, hey, it must be coming from the mat itself because the iron is way too hot. Okay. So keep that in mind too. All right. Let's see. Um, Margie's asking, Hey Margie, I'm glad that you're on cause I'm answering your question. <laughs> She's asking, do you ever get little fibers on the backside of your fabric after ironing on your wool mat? You know, I haven't seen that. And, and, and I'm one that if you see me, I'm doing a demo and I'm like picking the little threads off. And I really haven't seen that issue because you can see that there are different fibers in there. You see some whites, you know, it's natural wool. So you'll see from whatever the breed is that they use to make these, you have some whites, some grays, some blacks some browns and stuff. And it's just like modeled, you know, kind of all over. But I haven't really had that issue with little bits, Margie but maybe it's because I haven't used it on solid fabrics. Hmm, that'd be something. If anybody's had experience with that, let us know in the comments below. All right. Uh, oh, thank you, Susie. She shared the link to her, the three bag course bundle on her Facebook page. She says she has a lot of friends who covet her everyday totes. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. All right. So that's that about the wool mats. And I see Mary Grace is saying that she really likes her wool mat. She says she keeps the 14 by 14 inch one she has on her ironing board. So that's another good option too. If you're kind of pressing different things and you need the flat surface of an ironing board, like uh, my mini ones that I use, y'all know that I make them. Uh, I have a tutorial on my YouTube channel for making uh, like a little DIY uh, ironing mat that's quick and easy to make. And I used to make them out of my kids' um, leftover toddler puzzles. When they would lose a piece or two or five, I would flip it over and cover it with batting and a staple gun and just cover it with, with several layers of batting and then fabric and make my own pressing mat. So sometimes, and you'll notice that I really like pressing on something hard and flat so that my seams are crisp. And so going back to talking about the wool mat, that's kind of what it does because it has, or it is felted wool. It's, it's a dense, really dense surface to be pressing on. So that's probably one of the best things I like about it too for that. All right. Uh, huh. Nancy says she said that she's seen a tool that cleans the wool mat and she's not sure if they're good or not. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. I'll have to look that up and see what people are using, especially for my little stains here <laughs> on this one that I should check out. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next question. Now, question number two is from Brenda and Brenda asks, would a walking foot be good to use for knit fabrics? I have a hard time sewing knits. So Brenda, I'm glad you asked that question. Now it's going to depend. I am someone who, I mean, currently owns, I don't know, 20 some sewing machines or so and all the different sizes. You know, we used to have a studio and a brick and mortar store where I taught classes to kids and adults. I've been through a lot of sewing machines. Okay. From vintage ones to top of the line, newer ones. Now, what I have seen is that it depends on the machine make and model. Okay. Some machines, I can sew stretch knit fabrics with no issues and I don't need a walking foot. But I remember when I first started kind of sewing with knits, you know, over a decade ago or a decade and a half ago, I had, I think, a brother sewing machine that was computerized and I had to put on the walking foot to stitch on that machine with any type of stretch knit fabrics because it would just eat the fabric. If it was a lightweight knit, it would just eat it. And I had to have those feed dogs going on top from my walking foot. And let me find my walking foot that I took out to show y'all because otherwise, forget it. The machine was not going to get past that for sewing. Okay. So this is a walking foot for those of you that don't know. And some higher end machines will include it in the accessory pack, whereas other machines don't really come with this. So you have to usually buy a generic one or you can buy a proprietary one, which is going to be like five times the cost. This is a generic one that I got off of Amazon, a walking foot for low shank machines, because the little machine that I'm using here on Whip Wednesday episodes uh, is a low shank machine. And we actually have these back in stock, heads up, because I know some of y'all are always waiting because we sell out so quickly. This is a Juki LB5020, which is a great backup machine, a great class, a retreat machine, great for beginners who already know about sewing. Like this is a little bit of an investment. It's about $400. If you're just starting off, you know what I mean? You might not want to spend that much and then kind of sew two seams and then be like, eh, I don't really like sewing. But if you have maybe a student or, or a younger person who's starting off and you see that they're getting into sewing more and more, this would be a great upgrade machine. Okay. So yeah, we have some in stock. Um, we just restocked them. Now, the walking foot here has to be attached in a certain way to the machine, okay? And I'm going to get to this in a second, but first, let's talk a little bit about the stretch knits and why it is that 
you know, we have to, on some machines, have to put on the walking foot. So these are little legging shorts um, that I made for my daughter way back when using the Clara Leggings online course that I have and I offer on my sh in my shop. This was done completely with a sewing machine, okay? You can see the zigzag stitches right here, and that is how it's finished off. A lot of times I have students ask, like, do you need a serger for that? I like to teach the classes with what you can do on a regular sewing machine so you can still complete the projects. So something like this, you could absolutely do. You could do it on a serger, but you can also do it if your sewing machine has a zigzag stitch, okay? And so when we say stretch knit fabrics, this is what we're talking about. This happens to be a cotton spandex blend, like a 95% cotton, 5% spandex. This also, this is, I believe, an art gallery print. Let's see, it is one of the knits that we sold in kits and pajama kits a couple of years ago. But again, it's a 95% cotton, 5% spandex blend, okay? This solid pink is the same. Stretch knits also come thicker and they even come lighter, okay? This is one of my tops. This is a Westchester Dolman top, which is a free pattern that we offer, a free PDF pattern, for a ladies top that can be made out of stretch knits. And this is actually a double knit. This is Liverpool. So although it still stretches, okay, it's significantly heavier, like heftier. And this is all mostly all polyester and spandex. Okay. So that's why you see the stretch, but it just has a heavier weight. So it's great for, you know, cooler temp tops and dresses and things like that, that have a little bit more structure to the fabric. Okay. But again, this was done on a sewing machine, even the hem. And you can see that my stitches are not popping. So these are all things that I teach in the classes that I'm talking about for these stretch knits. So let me show you on this machine, what it looks like when I sew stretch knits. And let's just go in and hack away a chunk of this fabric real quick. So you usually want to have some type of a zigzag stitch, whether it's a lightning stitch, you'll see it, you'll hear it called sometimes a Harry Potter stitch. It's just a slanted zigzag. So right here, <clears throat> you can see that this is a zigzag stitch, right? This is a triple zigzag stitch, but numbers five and six on this machine are slanted zigzag stitches, okay? And that's what we would call the lightning bolt stitch or stretch stitch. And that's usually what you want to use. It's, it's slanted like that because it kind of plays as like a straight stitch, so you can still stitch a straight seam, but because of the little jump in the zag, okay, it's uh, making it so that the fabric stretches along with the stitches and doesn't just pop. So if I were stitching, say, two layers of fabric like this, and I'm using cotton thread here, which I do not recommend, but this is just for a quick demo, I would use a polyester thread, a good quality 100% polyester for stretch fabrics. Polyester is a, a man-made fiber. It's going to be stronger than cotton. So if it's for wearing, especially dance wear, active wear, swim wear, and you plan to stretch those seams and be using it and moving with the garment on, you don't want cotton because it might pop on you. And <laughs> that would be very embarrassing for your me made clothes to start falling apart while you're at the gym. I always used to test my stuff. I'd walk into the gym and like not tell anybody that I made these leggings and then I'd squat down and I'd be like, whoo, no pop seams. I did good. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to select stitch number five on my machine here. So I'm going to go up to five. And then it gives you default settings for the stitch length and the width. You always want to stitch out just a little sample bit of it and see, do I need to adjust the length of the stitch or the width of it? And I'm just going to go a little bit bigger um, just because I don't even remember what this looks like. So two, I'm going to go two millimeter stitch side to side and then 2.5 in the width. Let, um, yep, that's as high as we can go. So let's do that and try it out. So notice on this machine, I just have the universal foot on. I haven't even put on a walking foot. And so depending on the pattern, depending on the course, whatever it is that you're making, some designers and, and sewists will tell you to stretch the fabric. For me, it really depends on where that piece is that you're attaching. If it's a neckband, we tend to cut the neckband smaller. We use a formula that I give in the, in the class for the Westchester Dolman top. I give you the formula. We calculate the neckband and we make it a little bit smaller and we do pull as we sew it so that it basically brings in the neckline and it shrinks it down without having a neckline that stands up and is gaping out like that. And so, you know, depending on whether or not you're stretching the fabric as you sew or just keeping it, you know, and letting it feed through, you can see I don't even have to hold it and this machine is great for that. Not all computerized sewing machines are going to stitch like this one, I'm going to tell you right now, okay? 
Y'all have seen me make all kinds of stuff on that Juki LB5020. So here you can see the little bit of rippling. Wherever I pulled it and stretched it, there'll be rippling there because I was stretching the fabric as we went, which is what you want on some of those seams that are going to get the most wear and tear. It's not really a big deal. If you press it and just give it a little bit of steam, the fabric itself will relax a little bit. So again, it just depends on the project or what piece you're attaching, whether or not it's telling you to stretch it as you sew or not. Okay. Now, if your machine cannot do that, okay, and then you need a walking foot and this helps and you might still have issues. Not all machines are, are great for this. Okay. Uh, sometimes you'll need a machine that, you know, the manufacturer has a specific model that's better suited for garment sewing. Some of them will have like names, you know, that they're, they're more suited for home decor and it'll be like the home decor version of the machine or the quilting version, you know, stuff like that. So it's one of the reasons I like selling this machine. It's the only sewing machine we sell in our shop because I know that it can do everything because I've done everything on it. Okay. And again, for those of you that are new, you can check us out at craftygemini.com slash shop. That's our shop link. And um, anything that I talk about that we carry and sell, you can find it there. So before I attach this, you'll see I took off not just the presser foot, but also the ankle. Okay. So it, I took it off by taking off the entire screw. Now this guy needs to go on the machine. Here is where the screw is going to go. So that needs to be right on that bar that's coming off of the machine where you attach it. But there's also something else on a walking foot. This here. It has a little letter C and that needs to be clamped over the needle bar. If you install this here correctly, but this bar is down, you're not going to get the same effect of the walking foot. This needs to go up and down because look what happens when I lift this leg up and down. You see that this other plastic bit, this is what we would call the feed dogs that are on top. Do you see the white part here? Let me give you a little close up just because I want you to understand the different parts of this thing. So if I pull this up, you can kind of see this here goes up and down. Look, oh, uh, there you go. Okay. So you see how those are going up and down. This is plastic feed dogs that are going on the top of the fabric now, and they're going up and down as the machine stitches the same way that the feed dogs go up and down underneath. So now you have feed dogs under and feed dogs on top, and that is going to help the fabric feed through smoother, which helps when you're dealing with thin, lightweight fabrics, bulky fabrics and stretch knit. So if you don't have a walking foot for whatever machine you're using, it's definitely worth getting. Okay. Now this one, again, this needs to be over top of the needle bar. So it's a little tricky to get on there. You just have to make sure that you have it in the right place first before I start aligning this part here for the screw. Okay. So that is in place. Let me try to Put the screw in place by hand as much as I can first and then I'll go in and tighten it up with the screwdriver. Perfect. And that's it. You just, that's the only thing about it that because it's a specialty foot and it requires, you know, it's, you need to have that other part of the bar over top of the needle bar. It's not just going to be a snap on foot. Okay. You need to be able to, um, take off the full ankle and put the whole foot on and make sure this is going to be nice and tight. And then we'll stitch a little bit with it so that y'all can see what's what when it comes to the walking foot. Okay. Is that right? Let me make sure. That plastic piece, I might have tightened it a bit too. Oh, there we go. There was still a little bit more play. Let me make sure it's nice and snug. So that's the other thing. You know, you got to make sure that it doesn't jiggle at all because the last thing you want is to sew and run the risk of hitting any part of that walking foot. And if your machine came with one, just read the user manual, you know, and install it with however it says. But I know that that's good there because I gave it a good tight snug. And then when I look at it from the front, the needle is right smack in the center of the foot. If it's off to the side or you see that the foot is a little bit lifted one side or the other, go back and reposition it because it's not sitting right. Okay. So now we talked about having the walking foot there and having those feed dogs on top. I'm just going to stitch right down here. And again, I just, I'm stitching through two layers of a cotton spandex. So here the needles coming down the bottom. And again, we have feed dogs underneath and on top. I'm going to oops, let me lengthen the stitch width a little bit just to make it a little wider and see. So see it's, I mean, I don't even have to touch it <laughs> and it's sewing pretty straight. But this machine just doesn't really give you no issues for a, a ton of different things. Okay. So let me cut this out. 
And so you, now you can see, because I wasn't even touching the fabric, okay, it is a lot smoother, right? If we have a look at that second row of stitching, because I didn't stretch it. So you can see how it affects, you know? If you are attaching some like fold over elastic or an elastic band around a, a leg opening of a swimsuit or something like that, you know, the pattern might tell you to stretch the fabric as you go. Other patterns might tell you not to stretch so much. So there you can see how it ended up stitching with the help of the walking foot, but I don't have any skip stitches or anything like that. So it's something that you'll have to play around with based on your machine make and model. Cause like I showed you earlier, I can do the same things without the walking foot. Okay. But it, you know that if you're already struggling, then I would seek out the walking foot for your machine. Okay. Just be sure. All right, let's see. Zena says, I just ordered some tiny screwdrivers to put my walking foot on my sewing machine. That's perfect. I have the ones that came with the machine. If you have one that has like a, a knob, something a little bit longer and chunkier that you can hold on to, those are even better. I know a lot of sewing machine shops sell those. So that's great. Uh, Glenn is asking where you can find the walking foot. So I got mine off of Amazon. I just typed in walking foot and type in your sewing machine make and model, and you can find the one for that. Just make sure that in the description, it tells you that that can fit on your specific model because some machines are low shank or high shank and it might not fit all the models of a certain brand. You just got to do a little bit of research on that. You can also usually check your user manual and it'll have a couple pages in there that talk about the accessories and it'll have a walking foot usually that says like optional accessory, but it'll have at least a part number that then you can contact your dealer and find the part number that you want for that machine. Okay. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, said the overhead picture was blurs because I had nothing up here. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, oh, Monica says she has that tool that Nancy was talking about in the chat earlier about a, a tool that cleans the um, wool mats, and she likes it uh, a lot. She says it works very well. That's good to know. I'm going to look into that for sure. Yes. Okay, so that was that. To answer Brenda's question, would a walking foot be good uh, to use for knit fabrics, it would. I mean, it will definitely help, but I just like to show both ways because you might not need it if your machine can handle it like this one can, okay? All right, so next question. What is the little black knob on the universal sewing foot for? So we're gonna go and put this foot back on this machine so we can talk about this. But this is the little black button that, and this question is from Carolyn. Carolyn's asking about the little black knob or button here on the universal sewing foot. So let me take off the walking foot. I just wanna make sure I wasn't gonna cover anything else with this walking foot that took me minutes to put on. <laughs> okay, let's take off the walking foot. And it's a little cumbersome because the walking foot is so chunky that the other parts of it kind of get in the way of where the screw is. So, you know, if you have a longer screwdriver, and it could be both flathead or um, Phillips, because it has both has like a longer section for a flat head. Okay, so that's off. Let's go ahead and put the ankle on this one. I'm gonna pop this part off just so it's easier to get this little thing back on. And for those of you that maybe have never changed the feet on your sewing machine, don't freak out. You don't always have to do that. That's just for the walking foot. If you have a machine that has snap-on feet, you just snap them on and off. And I'll show you how when we put this universal one back on, okay? but it does need to be aligned so that the screw is right in line with the, the hole where it needs to go. Can't go not even a little bit up or down. Um, Mary Grace says, someone had a question about what a low shank is. It's just where the ankle screws into that bar of the machine. So some are higher up. It's like a distance, half an inch, three quarters of an inch. And so if your machine, say, connects higher up and you get a low shank one, then it's not going to fit. Okay, so that's why I'm saying you have to have the right one for your specific machine. So use or read your user manual if you have it. <laughs> All that info will be in there. Okay, so let's get this per, this foot back on and this is how easy it is to change out some of those specialty feet. That's it. I just put it under the bar, bring the presser foot down and it'll snap right on, okay? Uh, Eunice says, the walking foot I bought for my brother machine was the best investment, I'm telling you. And if you sew bulky items too, y'all, if you're making bags, if you're making thick, thick, bulky straps for handbags, if you're quilting, if you're wanting to do straight line quilting or even slightly wavy lines, that walking foot is going to be a game changer so that you don't get those puckers and pleats on the back of your quilt. Because remember, the point of the walking foot is that you're adding feed dogs now to the top layers of the project. So the machine has feed dogs that are pulling the fabric through underneath, and these help you on top. So it's just going to help keep everything more evenly flowing through the machine, okay? 
All right. Uh, Tamara says, I rarely take my walking foot off of my jukies. I use it for everything. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, let's see. Good. Okay. So what was I on? We're talking about the little black knob. So let me pop off the, the little foot and show y'all exactly what we're talking about. Oop, come on. Oh, okay. So here's a little button. If we have a closer look, it has a little spring just to the left of it. And when I press it, it's like spring loaded because it pops right back out. But when it's pressed in all the way, you can see that that little metal bar comes out on this side. Well, what's going to happen is, ooh, that thunder, is that it's going to get caught on the back part here of the rest of the ankle of the, of the machine, okay, of, the, of where the foot clips on. And it's going to help balance and keep the level of the foot even. So this little black button is used when you are sewing whatever you've been sewing for that whole project. Say it's like two layers of fabric and you're going, going, going. And then say maybe you have to attach a little hardware strap or a piece of fabric that's more bundled up and is going to be a higher level than what you've been sewing. So as you approach that bulk, it's going to tip your foot up, okay? If we look here you can see that the foot is snapped on correctly, but you see all that give I have there? Well, that is what allows the machine to kind of keep flowing through. It's not just gonna stop in its track if it hits something a little bit um, thicker, right? Higher up. It's just going to tip up and adjust and keep going and up and down. So you have that give, right? But if I and start to sew something that's super thick, it's going to tip the front up like this, and then the back of the foot is gonna be down. So sometimes, and this may have happened to some of y'all, you get skip stitches because the, the height here is not flat, it's not level, and so the needle kind of goes in, but as the needle goes in, in the machine and pulls up the bobbin thread, there's way more space before it goes to do the next one, and it can throw things off a little bit. So if you've had skip stitches, when you go from a steady level to a, a higher one, and then it kind of evens out again, this can help if it's not too bulky, okay? Is by pressing in this little button. So I just grab a couple scraps here to kind of show you what you would do if you were um, needing to, you know, like wanted to use the little black button, okay? So say this was two layers, it's not, but pretend. And I was sewing two layers of fabric there and then I got to somewhere that was bulkier like this and I needed to stitch this on or something. Or it was like a tab that went like this in the middle of something, okay? See how you're gonna go from a lower level to a significantly higher level here, okay? So you would start, I mean, you would be sewing away. Let's go back to a straight stitch. And I'm not gonna do this because this is like eight layers of a fusible fleece. Uh, okay, so... Default position is in the middle, 3.5, okay. So, and I have my stitch length set to 2.4, anywhere between two to 2.5, say your regular stitch length, okay? So you're sewing, la da 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 da, and now you're getting up to where this is bulkier and you don't wanna have skip stitches. So you get as, keep stitching until you get as close to the bulk as you can, and you'll start to see the tip of the foot already is coming up, okay? So I'm gonna keep going, and I'm gonna take a stitch onto the bulk, now I'm gonna come back here and press this little black, the black button, okay? Notice what I did with this finger. I sometimes will pull this down to help it come up in the back and so it locks it. I'm gonna unplug this just so I can turn the machine around and show y'all the visual, okay? This is the black button. Do you see how there you don't see the spring anymore? It's fully in. And that is because it's now locked that position where the foot is stable, okay? So you don't have to like press it with your finger and hold it as you're stitching. Press it in when it locks because the little metal bar is coming out to the other side. The height underneath the presser foot is locking it steady and level, okay? So now I can keep sewing. And once you work your way beyond the other side of the bulk, guess what happens? That little spring releases and you just keep sewing regularly, okay? So it's just like a little temporary kind of help and hold there as you work your way over a little bit of bulk. So I see I press the button, it's not springing out, it's stuck in there, okay? You can't even see it from out here because it's completely in. And so I just keep sewing. The machine was resetting since I had unplugged it and turned it off. And look, because it's already to the edge of the bulk, I can see I heard the little spring release and now you can actually see the spring. Do you see that, how now I can go like that? Before it was fully just in, okay? So once you work your way over the bulk, 
the foot releases, the little spring lets go of the bar. It no longer needs to stay level and flat to go over the bulk. And then when you have a look at what you stitched, you don't have any skip stitches, okay? It goes over it from here lower to up here, perfect, perfect stitches, and the same as it released closer to this end and just you keep sewing, okay? So that is how you use that. Granted, this is not gonna work if you're going over like a huge thing. If you're going from two layers of fabric to something super chunky, then you're gonna wanna use one of those seam humper jumper things that usually come with some sewing machines for doing like a jean or denim seams. It's like another piece that you do, but it's the same idea. It will level out the presser foot at a higher level so that you can still stitch across and then come back down, okay? Awesome. Oh, wow, that's so funny that y'all didn't know that. Tamara says, wow, I never knew how to do that with the spring button, thanks. That's great. Oh, I'm glad to help. Windless Original says, wow, that's neat. I learn something every time I watch your videos. Absolutely, and it's built in there, y'all. So give it a try. And remember, as you approach the bulk, press this in, and what I do sometimes is kind of pull that foot forward, like down, because I can see it already start to lift up when I'm approaching the bulk. You put it down and press the button in. If it pops out with the spring, that tells me that you're not quite to where the bulky area is because it hasn't yet affected the pitch of the foot, okay? So maybe take one stitch onto the bulk and then try it again. Once that little button stays in and the spring doesn't pop it back out, then you know it's engaged at that flat level to go over the bulk and then just keep stitching and it'll un you know disengage itself like you saw it did here. Okay, oh wow. <laughs> Tamara says, I can't wait to try using that and Lydia says, wow. Uh, I never knew about the black button. Well, I'm glad that uh, Carolyn asked the question then. Great, and thank you for everybody for tuning in. This is a good one. All right, now the last question I have here is from uh, Lynn. And Lynn says, hey, I hope this makes sense. When I sew a seam, I match my fabrics good side to good side, so pretty sides touching, and both ends match up. But when I get done sewing, the top fabric is always longer than the bottom fabric. She says it does it every single time, and it doesn't matter the fabric I use, cotton and cotton, cotton and waterproof fabric or canvas and cotton. Uh, does this mean that my tension or some other setting is off on my machine? I've used clips, pins, and I just hold the fabric with my hands to try and keep the fabric the same, but the top always ends up longer. So this is great because I think this is probably one of the most common uh, issues, it's not really an issue though. You just gotta understand what's going on in order to change it. And let me grab my two little sample strips of just cotton fabric that I put here. So here's the deal. Uh, Lynn says, she's sewing, say two pieces of cotton. She puts them pretty sides touching, okay? She's gonna put pins, and I'll just grab a couple pins. And so let's first double check that these two measure the same because I just eyeballed the cutting. Okay, now they're the same, okay? So from here to here, both pieces measure the same. Um, lost my pin, lost my pin. Okay, let me grab another one. So say we put a little pin here. Here are my pins. And then another one here. Okay, so here's the deal. And everybody, I think, watching this, if you've ever sewn anything on a sewing machine, you can relate. You cut your fabrics perfectly. You pin them perfectly, okay? Then you start to sew. So let's say I'm piecing and I'm gonna stitch a quarter of an inch seam allowance. Here's what happens. Lynn says she starts sewing and here, before I start, they measure the same to the bottom. But when she finishes the seam, the top fabric here always ends up longer, okay? So I'm gonna try to do it. I've been doing this so long that I don't really have this issue anymore because of what I do to prep my fabric. And those of you that watch my videos and are in my courses, go ahead and type that in the comments below and let me know what it is that I do before I start sewing that helps me prevent this issue. Okay, I'm gonna wait to see a comment and see if somebody can guess it. I'm gonna line things up so I can stitch a quarter of an inch seam. <laughs> hi, Lisa, she says, hi, neighbor, another Florida friend. All right, I know there's a delay, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Yes, thank you, JC Cantu Louie. The correct answer, starch. When you starch your fabrics, it makes the fabric not as flimsy and pliable, it makes it crisper, and so what does that mean? That the fabric is going to stay 
as it is and eat no matter how hard you're holding on to it and pulling on it and you know messing with it to try and get everything super straight you're not going to be able to easily distort that fabric for those of you that pre-wash all your quilting cottons y'all know i'm not the one i only pre-wash garment fabrics okay if it's designer quality quilting cotton i'm not washing it the design, the, the manufacturers tell you not to, right? Because they sell pre-cut fabrics and you're not going to pre-wash pre-cut fabrics. Instead, I do a cheater's version where you add heat and moisture and that's going to pre-shrink it a little bit without you having to wash it. So that's what I do when I starch and then press the fabric. But not only in the pre-shrinking, adding the moisture from the starch and the heat of the iron, am I doing that little you know, cheater pre-shrinking, but I'm also adding the starch to the fabric so that it's less easily manipulated or distorted. And that's what's gonna help you avoid this here. So let me try to do what she has, or the issue that she has. So say you start sewing, I backstitch here. I'm gonna start taking out my pins, and this is what I see a lot of beginners do. Instead of allowing the machine and the feed dogs to do the work and pull the fabrics through, they're holding on to it here for dear life, like, uh. So your stitches are gonna be super teensy, and you're gonna be stretching, distorting the fabric as the machine stitches. So here, here's what happens. I took out this pin. So now the feed dogs are feeding in the bottom layer of fabric better than they are the top, right? Because this fabric is on top of it. And then they start like this. And they're holding, and they're holding, and they're holding as the machine stitches. And then look what happens when I get to the end. You get to the end, you take it off, and you're like, what? It's legit a quarter of an inch longer than it was when I started, right? So do you see that? And so this is the issue that she's having and that everybody has. <laughs> so my tips for handling that are don't yank on the fabric, right, when you're sewing. If you cut it accurately, well, first, starch it so that you set the fabric, okay? Keep it a little bit crisper. And if you've ever seen beginner sewing classes and stuff, this is how I often would start teaching kids because, you know, I taught my kids how to sew when they were two and three years old on a real sewing machine. So first you start off just stitching through paper with no thread just so that they can maneuver, hey, this is what you're watching, this is how you're aligning it. And so we often start off with having them stitch through paper because the paper is not as pliable and fluid as the fabric. Okay, so it helps them hold something nice and straight. They're following a line or following a guide of some kind and you don't have the fluidity of the fabric because the last thing I want is a kid going like this to try and smooth something out and running their fingers underneath the needle. Okay, so if we can get our fabric to be closer to a paper like state, you too are going to have better results with the fabric not moving and not being distorted. Okay, so remember that start your fabric and then don't hold on to it. Let the feed dogs pull the fabric out of your hands. Your job, your only job, by the time you get here for sewing, is to guide it straight. You don't want to be going like this. All you want to do is look at your guide, whether it's on the base of your machine or the edge of your presser foot, and just literally, if you need a hole with like two fingers, just guide straight. The machine will pull. You don't have to come back here, which is something I see a lot of beginners do, is they grab from back here, and so as the machine is sewing, they go like this, and they're feeding it through while they're yanking on it on the back. Don't do that. You don't need to pull on the fabric. If it was the correct size, and you put pins, and you know they should match up, let the machine feed it through evenly, okay? So hopefully that helps, because, I mean, come on, a quarter of an inch off? That's huge. And then you see what happens is I kind of have, it's probably a little tricky to see, but I have all this rippling here because the fabric was getting stretched as it was stitching. So the stitches are kind of anchoring down those little puckers. And so what happens is you come here to go press this and it's not going to lie as flat as it would. It's literally bubbling right here. I can already see it because this one got stretched out. And so this one is just like scrunched up in there. Okay. So be careful with that. Don't pull your fabric from the front or from the back. Let the feed dogs do the work and don't forget to starch, okay? So yes, that is how you do that. Oh great, Margie's sharing her a recipe for uh, homemade starch. She says two parts distilled water to one part vodka. Awesome. Okay, great, Cecilia says, I've been sewing for the past 50 years. I never knew about the black button. You learn something new every day. Well, I'm glad you tuned in today for Whip Wednesday, Cecilia. I'm glad that I was able to teach y'all a little tip there that you can definitely use to help you out in your projects, okay? All right, so yes, that is my tip for that. 
And that's all the questions I have for today. So thank you everybody for tuning in. Remember that we have a three course bundle sale right now. The details are at the beginning of this video of this Whip Wednesday episode and the link to sign up, it's only valid today, Wednesday, May 17th to Sunday, May 21st at 11.59 p.m. And you can get three of my courses that normally cost $37 each for a little over 22 bucks each in a bundle. Three different tote bag projects, step-by-step -step video lessons that never expire for only 67 bucks. Okay. So any other questions for me, leave them in the chat below. I will see y'all in the next video. I hope you find some time this week to do a little bit of sewing or quilting. And thanks again for watching. Don't forget to share the videos. Bye y'all.